My first guest tonight burst into prominence in 1977 as Luke Skywalker. Uh, currently, he is in New York City playing quite a different character, Mozart, in the Broadway production of Amadeus. And we are more than happy to have him with us here tonight. Please welcome Mr. Mark Hamill. Mark. <laughs> Nice to see you. Thank you very much for uh, being on the program. And by the way, I thought you were terrific in uh, Return of the Jedi. Thank you. A very nice job there, Thanks sir. Thanks very much. Let's uh, uh, talk a little bit about the, the part you're currently playing. I started uh, thinking that uh, I should get back to why I became an actor in the first place, because I did a lot of plays in high school and in college. None of my family was in show business. Uh, what did they do? What, what did your folks well, my do? My father was in the Navy. Uh, I have a brother who's a doctor who is considered the success of the family to this day. Oh, I see. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, I'd done a lot of television, and I'd been working, basically. I'm 31 now. I've been ba basically working steadily since I was 17. And, of course, in 77, I became an overnight success and discovered that... Uh, People sort of forget, really, that the films were made for young people. George Lucas wanted to make, like, the ultimate Saturday matinee. We never thought we'd be reviewed by Time magazine. We just mm -hmm. thought we'd be making a, a, a real good popcorn movie. Yeah. Uh, and I'd, I wasn't worried about typecasting or anything else that the journalists would ask me. And then I discovered that it's really true. First of all, there are not a lot of films being made. Uh, there are tremendous financial risks involved. And the only way that you can really sort of stay, keep your finger in the pot, so to speak, is, is come to New York, come to New York, do workshops. Anybody can audition for plays. If you can just make it in off the street, they'll see you. And that wasn't always the case in California. So I started auditioning for everything. It didn't matter. I mean, now, now uh, what, what was the reaction? Because this was after the success of the first movie. So you're a, you're a big deal. Uh, now, what was the reaction to the people that you were auditioning with when they said, well, well there was a guy look who's here, the, Mark Hamill wants to be in the play. There was a guy at the Amadeus audition who was also auditioning for Mozart, and he said, what are you doing here? Will you get the film rights to the, <laughs> to the play or something? <laughs> I said, no, no, I'm just trying out like everybody else. They're suspicious a little bit, huh? Suspicious, yeah. yes. They thought maybe I was some sort of entrepreneur or something. But uh, I don't know. I auditioned for it, and I sort of got myself into a situation that I couldn't extricate myself from. I wasn't really relishing the idea. I did it with the national tour with John Wood and Michelle Seiler for six months. In fact, they're, they're at the Fisher Theater in Detroit now, so if anyone's in the Michigan area, charter a bus, sell the family <laughs> pet, and get out and see the show. It's a wonderful production, the national tour. But, uh, I, you know, I was auditioning for Sir Peter Hall, and, I mean, fortunately, he had no idea who I was, but, I mean, I was still terrified. But I knew I had the element of surprise going for me because, you know, people, when they see a special effects movie like that and they know it's not real, they just can't imagine that you're really doing anything, mm -hmm. you know, because they know it's, it's magic of some sort. But I, I auditioned for him, and I wound up being offered the role, and I thought I'd never be able to live m with myself if I said, hey, you know what, I turned down Amadeus. And they'd say, yeah, sure. So yesterday I gave my 200th... 13th performance. So now I know what it's like to do a long run. Yeah, yeah. Well, now this, this guy, um, uh, Mr. Mozart, uh, he, uh, fr from what I know of this, he was kind of a, uh, uh, he was uh, twisted a little. He was a little, he was... Well, he was a child prodigy who never really grew up, and uh, he was the first freelance musician in the sense that uh, you had to have a commission to be able to write music in those days. And really, it's mostly based on the fact that Peter Schaffer was a musical critic for the London Times, and he came across these letters that were really scatological in content and a real earthy humor. And uh, Letters from... Uh... Letters to his cousin, Bosley, to mm -hmm. his wife, Constanza. But the whole family life was like that. They the were mother almost, was like yeah. that, the father was like that. They were from a provincial town, Salzburg, which was sort of like a joke to people in Vienna. And... Uh, I think he was his own worst enemy. He always spoke his own mind. But the contrast, the, the real spark for the play is how could this man who wrote this incredibly pure music be someone who could jump up on furniture and imitate animals and mm -hmm. goose people and drink wine and, and do kind of, you know, I mean, because they've always painted him as this porcelain figure. I first heard about it when Paul Schofield was doing it at the National, and I figured Paul Schofield was playing Mozart. I had no idea. I mean, I really didn't have a background in classical music. But uh, it, it's really wonderful for me to play a character that's not really likable, especially in Act One. Yeah. 
And since I'm playing to a lot of out-of-towners now, because most of the New Yorkers have seen Amadeus, they're still shocked. I can't believe it sometimes, because it's fairly tame, but since they're in 18th century garb, well, the stuff it's more that, shocking. Uh, in all honesty, the stuff that I heard uh, this afternoon and that we were discussing was, uh, I would be shocked by it. Well, uh, unfortunately, we can't we can't tell people what's so shocking about it. But you're going to have to trust us here. It's just uh, it's just <laughs> ugly uh, beyond your wildest imagination. <laughs> Mark Hamill is is here. Uh, you, you mentioned a, a name that I didn't recognize when you mentioned it, and let's point out who that was. Sir I, Peter Hall. Yes, I've never heard of him. Is the he was the founder of the Royal Shakespeare Company, and he was at the National Theatre in London. The chances of me ever working with him are so negligible. I thought, there's. I better take this or I'll never get the chance. They do bring a lot of English cast to America, but it's not really reciprocal. I don't think yeah. they let Americans go to England very much. But uh, uh, he's a biggie. Yeah. So but he, also, too, he had no idea. Of, I mean, he, he has never seen Star Wars. This guy has not gone to Star Wars? No. Hmm. He's like the guy who refuses to see E.T. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but I think he's pretty busy, yeah. you know, so... Yeah. Uh, uh, let me ask you about the, the story of, of people um, uh, camping out in your front yard oh, in California. Well, that, Although maybe we don't want to talk about that because you don't want to encourage that. Well, I mean, it's, Unless, it's the thing is, it's like people that talk about the merchandising or anything else. It's it's supply and demand. It's like any maybe pop group or or a hit television series. If it is supply and demand, if kids want to bring lunch boxes with that particular thing on it, uh, I, I I it amuses me actually because. Uh, I mean, look at how quaint some of the, like the Beatles bubble bath looks sure. these days. It'll probably be just collector's items in another 10 years. But what, what about the, uh, uh, in addition to the, uh, <laughs> it's, it's, it's the band, they have another job during oh, this time every night. <laughs> They're, uh, uh, I thought that was a rim shot. I didn't say anything No, funny. No, 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 we no, wouldn't no. do that. Uh, but yeah. you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, you're, you have a home, suddenly the movie comes out, you're a major yeah. star, and you got people living on your yard. Well, it was, yeah, and also they'd look through the window, so you'd find yourself going to change channels on the TV on your hands and knees. He said, this is no way to live. No, that's not good. This is no way to live, so I moved, and, you know, it's... But didn't you at one point actually uh, kind of deputize these folks? Well, I thought I better get them on my side, yeah. you know, don't alienate them, so I'd go out and sign secret packs where they wouldn't reveal the whereabouts of my secret abode and actually have them house sit when I would leave and... <laughs> Pick up my mail, you know, yeah. throw out all the leftovers in the fridge that we're getting kind of yeah, People rancid. like that are generally pretty responsible, so you want to put, put them in charge of your property. A better an ally than a, yeah. a, an enemy. By the way, the cast at the Broadhurst said, bribe David, go on and shamelessly... Uh, so this is from the cast at the Broadhurst, and they thought you'd like a t-shirt. I do like t-shirts. Well, there you go. I, I'll, I'll wear this with a great deal of pride. Thank you very much, Mark. It's awful nice. Thank you, sir. Uh, now you don't have to see the play. No, no, I'd go see this play in a okay. minute. Not, okay. I mean, you don't. They don't pass these out at the door anyway, do they? No, no, no. no. Um, tell me about the before you got into uh, full-time uh, acting and stardom and so forth. You were you had other jobs? Yeah, I did. You know, I was a, a janitor. I worked in an ice cream store. I worked at Associated Press. Which ice cream store? Can you uh, say? Yeah, well, it's closed now called Will Wright's. It was in Southern California. Will Wright's, I'm not familiar it, with it. It folded soon after I worked there. Good ice cream? Very good ice cream, yeah. yeah. Okay. I'm... And after that, you worked for. Uh... I worked for Associated Press for about 30 minutes. I thought I was, I mean, I thought it was like the front page. You know, I wanted to be like Ben Hecht and Charles MacArthur with a hat and a press card, you know? I had delusions of being Jimmy Olsen or something. Instead, I was sweeping out the stock room and cutting copy, and it was very frustrating. I finally went, I thought it was funny at the time. I, How old were you then? 17. Just a kid, a punk. <laughs> Mr. Punk to yeah. you. Uh, <laughs> but I went in, no, I thought this was amusing. I thought at least to get the attention of, of the city editor, and I, I kicked the door open, and I said, stop the presses, chief. I got a story that'll set this town right on its ear. He looked up from the desk and said, get out. <laughs> and so I did, but what I didn't realize is I came back to work the next day, and there was a pink slip in my box. He meant, like, get out of the building, out of my life. Yeah, yeah. Totally out, out, out of, of the hemisphere, gone. Gone. Your, your history. history right? uh, now, what are you, you going to do when the, uh, the uh, play closes, or when you leave it? I, 
you know, what what is your like you were talking about the probably not going to be another Star Wars, and would you do one if there was going to be another well, one? Well, George is very very tired. He's spoken sort of obliquely about a third trilogy, which won't be till like 2011. And mm. as proud as I am to have a job lined up at the turn of the century, I mean, I can't really <laughs> relate to it. Uh, uh, I, so I, I, for all you know, intents and purposes, I just figure, well, that's it. And I feel very lucky to have been able to do it. I know it's not a great showcase for actors, but I mean, I'm just starting out. I should be grateful. And I, yeah. I have a feeling that going on some of the talk shows, like when I was on Tom Snyder, I just came off sort of bitter. And I, and I don't feel that way, really. I had a real good time doing the, the movies. Uh, but I'd like to try other things. I'd love to meet a writer or a director that would like to sort of take that image, whatever image I have, and sort of mangle it yeah. for the American public. But you do. Which is why I did Lindsay Anderson's film. I didn't get paid for it. it. It was just a chance to, I mean, there are directors that I would work for without reading a script or, or anything. Mm -hmm. Just This was the third in the series of, uh, the name of the film? Oh, the well, adventure. the Britannia Hospital. I haven't seen it. I'm probably in it for like 30 seconds. Mm -hmm. But the idea was I should show people that I'm not, I'm mostly interested in a good role, not so much in the money. Well, you make a good point that this is just the beginning of a career. Actors, Hopefully. I mean, Hopefully. Yeah, yeah. And I, I love doing comedy. I'm a tremendous fan of, of the Monty Python people and Albert Brooks and, well, you and a lot of oh, Americans. Oh, now, you don't need no, to say no, that no, kind no, of no. stuff. You, no, just, I mean, well, you gave I, me the shirt, Mark. <laughs> let's, let's don't push our luck here. No, uh, you're okay. But uh, <laughs> Is that bad? No, that's fine. That's perfect. No, but I, the thing is, too, I mean, you want to show people that you are are courageous, that you want to take chances, that you don't want to just, if I, if I didn't feel serious about my career, I would just take the yeah. money and run and retire. Yeah. Because, you know, George was very generous. He cut us in on the profits, and if we spend it carefully, we probably won't have to work yeah. again for a long time. Listen, uh, I hate to cut you off here, but we're running a little bit late, and, okay. uh, and you got to go perform anyway tonight. Uh, it was a pleasure meeting you, Mark. Thanks for being here. Mr. Mark Hamill, Thank ladies you. and gentlemen. We'll be right back, folks.